Municipal governments are comprised of local elected officials encompass a range of administrative bodies, including cities, towns, villages, and municipal districts. This is the Political Trenches Local Government at Work, the show dedicated to talking about the most pressing issues confronting municipal governments throughout Canada. I, along with Ian McCormick, will provide insights and perspectives on the challenges and opportunities that confront local governments as they strive to serve their communities. Today, we are continuing our journey through the municipal alphabet, and today we bring you the letter R, which stands for retirement. Later in the episode, Ian and I will be joined by a former mayor who hung up his hat after eight years in the municipal arena. But first, we'll head to New Brunswick, where two councillors were relieved of their committee duties due to a code of conduct complaint brought forward by the mayor of the same community. Then we'll move to Windsor, where we'll be discussing the city's move to give priority booking to Windsor residents at city facilities. And finally, to end it all up, we'll be ending in the city of Greater Sudbury, which has moved a new policy around frivolous and vexatious complaints. But first, Ian, we have a jam-packed episode as always, but I have to ask, how was your Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving was actually fairly quiet. What you can't tell from that side of the screen is that I tested positive for COVID last week. So I've been isolated through the entirety of, of uh, uh, Thanksgiving. I missed out on turkey entirely. You? Uh, uh, it was not bad. It was not bad, but it didn't sound, it sounds like you were relieved of the in-laws coming over because that's always <laughs> the, the great thing about Thanksgiving. But I I, I want to start because, like I said, we have a jam-packed episode today, and I'm, we're going to be starting in New Brunswick, where St. John Mayor Donna Reardon says two councillors who are alleged to have supported striking workers crossed a fine line with their actions. Councillor Joanna Killen and Brett Harris were stripped of their council committee duties at a meeting earlier this month pending an investigation by an independent law firm into their conduct. The mayor, in an interview with Information Morning St. John, stated, if you want to talk to the people that you represent, that's fine. Go ahead and do that, but not during negotiations, end quote. Members of QP Local 486, which represents the city's administration, clerical, and support staff, have been on strike since September 12th after talks broke down over pay. Killen says she supports the union wage increase demands, while Harris said he spoke with the strikers to better understand their position. Ian, I have two questions on this story, and I want to start with the first one, and it's kind of the overarching one. When dealing with issues around city administrations, should councillors speak with administrations during an ongoing strike like these two councillors were alleged to have done, even if it's to learn about staff positions on said strike? I think it really muddies the water if they do that. Certainly, they are citizens of the municipality and interested in the municipality running well, but they've been elected by their peers, if you like, to be the board of directors of that municipality who is looking for a way to run it efficiently, as efficiently as possible in the services and uh, programs that are actually required. So when a member of a city council, one or more of them, kind of goes around the ordinarily ordinary a hierarchical process that would run through the city manager in this case, uh, that then really blurs the line between what governance is and what operations is. It also tends to, to take away from the authority that council as a whole has if the idea is that council decisions or council's debating process may not be exactly what is portrayed uh, to people, in this case, on the picket line. Uh, so it's a really tough Thing for these people to be engaged in. And I am not surprised at the reaction of the rest of council to this. Now, I should mention up front about this story that I know the two councillors that we are talking about. I've had them on our, our sister show, Cross Border Interviews, where we talked about New Brunswick politics and municipal governments. So after this story broke, uh, they did reach out to me and I, I had talked to them just to get their initial reactions and what was going on. So I just want to be upfront about that. So that way people are, are, are aware. But I want to talk about sort of the flip side of this, because this they have been removed from their committee roles which technically a vote can do that but they are being removed from those committee roles because of the code of conduct uh sort of issue that surrounds them talking to these striking workers right 
isn't it putting the cart before the horse in some sense? You're 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 automatically defining that they're guilty of breaking a code of conduct before an in third party investigation happens. Shouldn't the council and mayor have should have waited until the code of conduct report came forward to sort of make this move of relieving them of their committee uh, responsibilities? I don't think I don't think that that's really necessary. First of all, it would depend on the legislation, uh, on the code of conduct, and the provincial rules around code, the authority of codes of conduct, versus say bringing in somebody independent. In Ontario, they would already have somebody like an integrity commissioner assigned to a municipality and a council. In New Brunswick, that might not be the case. And of course, New Brunswick is going through a whole uh, whole spate of change at the moment too. But when councillors get involved in their office, or in local government office, they are expected to know the rules and follow the rules. And they are on the particular, they a particular group, the board of directors of the municipality. And it's tough for them as an entity, as an, as an it rather than a they, to be on both sides of a negotiation from a perceptual standpoint, if not on a from a reality standpoint. So I think the removing from committees is probably appropriate. Who knows what what happens after the independent report is uh, re received or released, if it is ever released. Uh, that, but ultimately, then the mayor, who is usually the person who appoints people to boards and committees, may make some changes at that point. I'd also like to say, too, that you know these, or have at least met these two councillors in question. I haven't. But I'm certainly not denigrating them by any, by any stretch, that this is one of those places sometimes where role clarity or the understanding of a role uh, comes into play in as much as somebody's personal politics may, which might be the case in this. It might be a good hearted reach out to somebody on the other side of the negotiating table. But there is the fact is there is a negotiating table between these members of council and the city manager and then the union and the people who work for the city in these particular roles that are being negotiated. So it just doesn't help with clarity at all. And the council needs to stay in council's position. I want to talk about the, the the code of conduct atmosphere for a bit here, if you don't mind, sure. because we're seeing more and more code of conduct uh, investigations coming to light. We saw it recently in Vancouver. We were seeing it here in uh, uh, in St. John. We, we saw it a little bit in uh, the rural municipality of Hanwell in New Brunswick. We saw it in Saskatchewan. While code of conducts are becoming more and more apparent, are you expecting more and more people to sort of try to figure out how to navigate code of conducts? Because there's sort of still a new term in the municipal arena outside of Ontario, which traditionally have a uh, integrity commissioner appointed right. for each municipality. I, I suppose the concept of a standalone uh, piece of legislation, a bylaw that governs codes of conduct and ethics for local government officials is new in a lot of places, particularly the, the force of a bylaw rather than a policy. And sometimes that's being mandated by the provinces and territories now, whereas it didn't used to be in a lot of cases. So there are there is some getting used to it for sure. But I think there has always been an ethical expectation on part of people who partake in civic life that they are to be held to a standard uh, above reproach by their colleagues on council and the staff of the municipality and the citizens that they support. So while the, the issue of more and more code of conduct investigations are happening, I don't think it's really a whole lot more in terms of the reason. I don't think the reason is because we're seeing more legislation. I think there are some other things at play about populism or lack of role clarity or um, that coffee shop Senate idea that I've mentioned from time to time as well which bring this into play and have actually required the institution of some of these codes of conduct and then the use of these codes of conduct. So I actually think it's a little bit of the other way around. The code of conduct is a result, not a cause. Sorry, can they yeah, be, the code can, of conduct can, itself. Can they be used in a frivolous ma manner though? Oh yeah, because, for sure they can. Because that's, that's the gray area that I've always looked at these issues. When I read about them, I go, is this just a frivolous matter where one person's upset with somebody else or is it an actual investigation where there needs to be uh, action taken to rectify a situation? Uh, while I'm just sort of new to the area of code of conduct and integrity and not, not new to the role of integrity, but new to the, these matters, do you see or have you seen where code of conducts are being used to settle sort of personal matters? Yeah, yeah. And it was ever thus. 
<laughs> the weaponization of policy, whether it's council to council or council to admin or even workplace harassment policy just within administrations as well, has done that, has been seen that way. But I think the the, the penalties that have started to be seen for frivolous and vexatious use of this, this weaponizing of policy, ought to be providing some pause for those people who are thinking about doing it this way. And the whole idea of gotcha being part of this as well is... Uh, something that is it's certainly ailing the body politic at the moment, and it is a wicked problem that we have to address collectively as citizens as well as elected officials. The city of Windsor residents will soon enjoy priority bookings for programming at city-owned facilities. Windsor City Council at a meeting in September approved a 72-hour pre-registration period for Windsor residents signing up for community programming, including booking ice time, renting facilities, registering for activities, and more. The decision came at the request of Ward 4 Councillor Mark McKenzie, who brought forth the motion that was unanimously approved by his council colleagues. Ian. With more larger hubs offering services that smaller communities don't, could we see what Windsor has just undertaken becoming a new norm in offering local residents priority booking for before anyone else, really? I don't think this is new. Uh, this really? the pay to, yeah, the pay to play idea, it, literally in this case, if, if we're paying for the pool, we get to play in it. Uh, is something that hasn't hasn't been different hasn't different sorry has been around for a long long time and we've what we're seeing more and more I think with the advent of things like um, rec complexes multi multi for multi purpose recreational facilities is because of the capital cost and probably the operating cost they just like you have said fall outside the reach of smaller municipalities so they tend to go to the larger ones. And oftentimes there is a, or an agreement amongst the re regional municipalities just to pick up a proportion of the cost, whether it's through grants or through um, in kind or through some sort of a, a loan or a cash uh, infusion. And really what that does is it gives the smaller municipalities that pay to play piece so that their local people can partake in the in whatever the facility is. And it could be a, I mean, it could be a recreational facility, but it could just as easily be a a museum or other cultural building as well, any publicly owned, any owned facility. And so what could, what could has happened in the past then is if I live in a, this municipality and I get free uh, initial access to early access to a program, or I get a, a lower differential fee, say the charge to come in to, to be part of it, it gives the preference to the, to the people who elected those people who are actually running that particular facility. So it's been going on for quite a long time. In this case, it, what it does to me is it kind of pokes a little bit of a stick in the eye of intermunicipal collaboration or cooperation. And what we might be seeing in this case, and others like it, is something bubbling to the surface, which has historically been something that is underground. Uh, the pay, the equity in costs or equity in, in providing uh, whatever the facility happens to be for that smaller population base. Are you not setting up, BBC? you just mentioned the key word that I was going to actually follow up on is the intermunicipal agreements. Now, I've sat around a table when intermunicipal agreements are sort of discussed and digested because uh, whether it be in northern, rural or remote communities, there are a lot of communities, particularly here in Alberta, who do have those intermunicipal agreements with their MDs, their counties, so on and so forth. Is this not then setting up two sort of categories of residents we have the residents and then the non-residents and could we not see then a sort of a deterioration of okay now you get a 72 hour period where you can register beforehand and now anyone who's not from the county or from the outside of the city has to pay double the registration fee compared to the true residents is this is not a slippery slope where we could potentially see even class systems for cost <laughs> involved yeah yeah, I, I'm not even sure it's that slippery, but it's uh, really <laughs> it certainly is. It's something that has historically happened and it's a point of friction between municipalities now that uh, how do we determine how many of my people go to use your facility? And if we are paying a portion of their fee um, collectively through the public purse, how do we make that determination? 
Sometimes it's by things like postal code, for example, or a spot survey that happens a couple of times a year to identify how many are from the home municipality, how many are from the neighboring one. So it is certainly something that happens. It's just not that common that we actually see it happening on the surface. In the city of Greater Sudbury, a policy was brought forward to the October 10th council meeting, actively seeking ways to mitigate the effects of chronic complainers who reoccurrence grievances are monopolizing a significant chunk of valuable city staff time. Frivolous and vexatious complaints policy aims to contribute to the city's commitment to service excellence and good governance by addressing all service requests and complaints equitably and efficiently and to protect staff from unreasonable behavior. The policy serves as a guide for the City of Greater Sudbury's employers to identify situations that meet the criteria for frivolous, vexatious, and or unreasonable persistent complaints and the associated actions that may be undertaken in such circumstances. Now, examples of what might be considered unreasonable behaviors include repeatedly submitting complaints about an issue which staff have already investigated and determined to be groundless with no new evidence, repeatedly challenging the findings of an investigation, complaining about the outcome, and or denying that an adequate response has been given, refusing to accept that an issue falls outside the scope of the city's jurisdiction, refusing to cooperate with the investigation process while still wanting the complaint to be resolved, immediately demanding to speak with a manager or supervisor without giving staff the opportunity to resolve the issue through regular channels and procedures, covertly recording meetings and conversations. And while a complaint is in process of being investigated or causing distress to staff through hostile, abusive, or offensive language, or fixating on an individual member or staff, or exhibiting behaviors to find by the city's workplace violence, harassment, and discrimination prevention policy. Ian, that's a lot to take under. The Greater Sudbury area is joining a list of municipalities across Canada that have implemented such similar policies in their communities, including Calgary, Ottawa, Oshawa, and Wasega Beach. How do municipalities need to balance the needs of the residents who have complained with the needs of the staff to ensure the issues are being addressed in an appropriate time? Well, first of all, I, this shows to me that the city values its staff, that they say your time is worth money, your mental health is worth something to us as well. We know that you are you are inefficient if you are act, having to act on things that you they, everybody knows are just there to gum up the system. So first and foremost, I think it's it's that way to support staff and doing it by policy, I think, makes it both predictable and transparent so that anybody who is approaching the city with one of these requests has the no can or ought to be able to anticipate if they're a reasonable person what the city's response is going to be. So in this case, I, I had a look through this policy, the draft policy that is going to or had in in our timing has gone to city council for a review. And it certainly makes a lot of sense. I my my thinking is also that it those people who crafted the policy, those people who uh, put it to put it to council are probably as frustrated as anybody else and would really much prefer not to have to have a policy like this. But with the adage of trying to keep those barn doors closed before the horses get out, let's put some uh, pieces in place here so that policy is in place, hopefully before it's really ne needed in a very thorough way. So uh, that's I think that's why this is coming here now. Do, do councils, because we have to remember, councils are elected by the people, the people who are the ones that are complaining, whether they have the, the right to complain or how many times they have the right to complain, that's for individual municipalities to make up that decision. If I was a councillor, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but if I'm a councillor, I would want people to address, have, have their issues addressed and addressed in a way that they can understand. Now, I understand that this is protecting administration, but I want to talk about the resident aspect here for a second, if you don't mind, because I think this is the most important part. How do you make people feel like they've been heard, the issues are addressed, without them feeling like it's just being brushed off because they're not being helpful or in some ways sort of reacting to what the city staff is being told or telling the resident? 
Well, I, when I read through the draft policy, there was nothing in it on my initial scope any that limited that freedom of expression, that ability to make a legitimate request. What it was trying to get away from was just what they had. They've got they've suggest here com these complaints, and I quote it from here: the complainant initiates the request with malicious intent or as part of a pattern of conduct that amounts to abuse of the complaints process. And then there are a series of factors that they say are li likely present. So to me, that doesn't stop the legitimate complaint. It, what it also doesn't do is stop uh, complaints of a political nature, that this is uh, by, for, and of this, the public's interaction with the city as a corporate body, rather than the interaction with city council. So it does, this doesn't apply to city council or presumably then to council meetings as well. So who knows whether something will be coming uh, to that a little bit later as well. But I think it's a, a very interesting exclusion. So we'll be right back after a quick break with our interview with the former mayor of the District of North Saanich, Jeff Ford. Welcome to Ours for Retirement on the Political Trenches Local Government at Work. So why do people leave political office at the height of their career? Why are there more people departing elected office at the municipal level than in previous years? Today, we are honored to have the former mayor of the District of North Saanich, British Columbia, Jeff Orr, on the show. Jeff served as the mayor from 2018 to 2022. He stepped away from the municipal government in November of 2022 by choosing not to run in that fall election. Prior to his term as mayor, he served as a councillor from 2014 to 2018. He began his time as an elected official with extensive experience in community relations, a community com uh, comprehensive understanding of local government and a willingness to learn, serve, and advocate on behalf of community members. Prior to being elected in 2014, Jeff was the president of the North Saanich Residents Association for eight years and chair of the Saanich Peninsula Water and Wastewater Commission for six years. He also enjoyed many years as the Peninsula Minor Hockey Association coach and executive member. He was also a member of the Capital Regional District Regional Water Supply Commission and served as a member of the Victoria Airport Authority Consultative Committee. So with that extensive resume under the belt, we are honored to welcome Jeff onto the political trenches. Jeff, welcome to the show. Yeah, I'm very pleased and honored to, to be here. So thank you for the invitation. So Jeff, as the episode is titled, R is for retirement, I, I want to sort of open up with a line of questions that was pretty straightforward question though. After four years as a counselor and then four years as a mayor, in the summer of 2022, you made the decision to retire from municipal office. Can you give us a reason why after eight years in office, you made that decision to leave the political arena? Yeah, it's a, it's a, probably a pretty difficult one to sort of really narrow down. And it, if you're okay with it, I, I'm just gonna read a paragraph from my announcement to the community. And that may sum it up a little bit. So what I wrote back in May of 2022 uh, was that um, I was encouraged to run in 2014 for council. Uh, and I began this journey, which wasn't part of any kind of master plan, you know, in my, uh, in my life. I was uh, privileged to be elected at that point. And during that time, I worked pretty hard to represent all residents. Uh, when uh, we had decisions to make at the council uh, table. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed my role uh, as a member of council and certainly as mayor, um, a role that for many, like, like many jobs, this can be simultaneously rewarding and, and very challenging. Um, and, I, and this probably gets to the heart of the matter. I am a gentle soul uh, by nature who believes in practicing empathy and compassion. Uh, and I had have to confess that the cumulative impact of the recent conflict around the in the community and less so at the council table, but in the community um, it has been hard on an awful lot of people, myself uh, included. So that gives you just a sense of, um, you know, really became a personal decision is, is, is this the right thing for me? to do even though I, I felt that I could still do the job and was electable 
uh, it was a time for me to to let someone else step in and and see how um, how they made out in public service uh, serving the community. Over your time as a community person and then as an elected person and now as a mayor emeritus, I think as you had referred to it, um, how have you seen the role of the local government leader change over the years that you were involved at least? Hmm. Yeah, but way that's um, you know, that's also hard. I, 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 I believe certainly being the leader um, is what you bring to the table. Everyone's leadership style will be different, and th those that perceive the role you play will have different assessment of your role as a leader. Uh, it would be fair to say, from an externality point of view, that you know the the variety of issues that we deal with trying to balance uh, you know budgeting physical infrastructure changes policy initiatives that deal with future forward thinking and there's a myriad of those as both of you know um, working together with other municipalities and we, we're a bit perhaps odd here that we have 13 municipalities in a fairly small area so so the ability to work together is, is is hugely important in my opinion, and so those are the those are the sort of uh, uh, impacts on how we do what we do. When you add to that the role the public plays in that, which is a public facing institution, municipalities, and you add the ways that they participate, social media, coming to council meetings, etc. I think what I saw was was um, certainly an increase. Uh, use of those other platforms, myself included. I, I went for probably first term almost without having a smartphone that did email and everything, and and finally, you know, made the switch. So so that has added an awful lot of uh, positives in terms of interaction. But boy, it comes with a lot of landmines in terms of uh, which I think is what's maybe changed a little is the negativity the the angst that you feel in the community and people's, some people's inability to participate in the process in a, in a civil and kind, respectful way. Uh, but as you look over your career as an elected official, councillor and then mayor, uh, and you have taken all those meetings and conversations and decisions and kind of synthesized them into, I don't know, the, the Jeff code, is there are there two <clears throat> or three things that you may you would pass on to people who may aspire to be a mayor or may aspire to be a councillor and to how to do the job well in service of their communities? Mm. Yeah, yeah de de definitely. And um, a little bit like when you when you get asked the question, well, what are the accomplishments? You, you forget a lot of them. And uh, and so if if I was to say you know, to pass it on, it would be, and, and then again, this is my perspective on how I feel that the role should be carried out. And um, uh, I think we need to fundamentally be willing to, to set aside some maybe strong opinions we have on things, uh, ideas about things, and not forget them, but set them aside in context of how we govern at the municipal level. And that is uh, one of, in our case, one of seven other communities are different numbers. And so what's important there is to, on behalf of the community, is to be able to exist in that decision-making body in a way that honors and respects all opinions at that table. Because in theory, the way the process should work is that the electorate out there elects people on balance that they see that are running that that might bring their part of view to the table they may vote for somebody that doesn't quite line up but brings a certain characteristic so that's one thing is to just really uh and also set aside in that personalities and work and i think i did a really really good job at the dialogue around the council table i didn't always agree with certain opinions coming my way but i was always very respectful to everyone around the table. And I think our council worked worked really, really well after having some bumpy ones in North Saanich and there's it's a bit bumpy uh, currently. Um, the other part of that is uh, relationships beyond the table. And I say that because on the peninsula here, we have three neighboring, Central Saanich, Sydney and North Saanich. 
And certainly before I came to office uh, in 2014, and, and even when I, before I came mayor, those relationships were not um, firing on all cylinders. And I think the public wants to see that because if you can't have a relationship on a one-to-one -one level with a, a, a mayor, a neighboring mayor, et cetera, then how can you expect to do things that we know are common interests? And there's many, many of them. And so it's really important to, in the same way, develop those relationships and go forward and make an effort to, you know, to do that. Um, you know, come into the role and, you um, be willing to set aside your ego and understand that you won't, you don't understand everything. You, you need to reach out and it's okay to reach out. And so the word vulnerability um, comes to mind and it, it's been a big part of me being elected uh, that word and what that means. And so that's about being vulnerable. It's, it's, it's being willing to say, you know, I don't quite know that, or, Hey, I made a, I made a mistake there. I think I need to revisit that. So, you know, there are, there, are, there are so many different levels of that. I, you might be catching in this. I, I'm, not, I'm not a big, big initiative person. I didn't come to the office trying to do A, B, C, and D. I came to the office having served the community in a different way for about 10 years prior and extending that, uh, that public service and doing that in a way that served the office and served the community uh, as best I can. So it's about having dialogue. It's about respecting other opinions and it's about having the courage and the conviction at times to make decisions that um, are difficult and that people may like it some people may not like it so i want to talk about the last year so we're coming up to one year since you left pri uh, public life for private life as a retired politician now for eight years you had to read a agenda package uh, on a weekly basis. I've got to ask the sort of the stupid question, but I got to ask it because I want to know for my own uh, Sandy, how often have you looked up the district of North Sandwich's uh, agenda for the coming week to sort of get an idea of what's going on in your community? Well, you know, I, I, I tell you, it's a, yeah, it, it, to say it's, it was a change is an, is an understatement. Um, yeah, not only look it up, read it, but create it and then make sure it's okay and time it and all these all these things so how many times have i you know i i i've been i've done a really good job of stepping away from it. and i think that i have looked up the the agendas maybe three times in the last year and and so that's just a, that was a, really a conscious choice to say that if i was to continue to look it up then have i really left that role and there is nothing, the other thing I've realized, there is, there is nothing that's so monumental that um, requires my attention to it to make sure it happens in, a, in the way that it, it, I think is the right way or the correct way. There, it just isn't, doesn't exist. So I'm, I was prepared to step away, to let others continue. A few others that left council at the same time didn't, haven't taken that approach and have been more engaged in it. And um, that's their decision and that's fine. I, I, do, I, I do check when there's something that really is what I would consider, you know, qu quite important in terms of how the council is governing themselves. And then, then I decide whether I need to be involved or not. And so far I have not you know, I've gone. I don't want to be a watchdog for because I know when I was in the role, when people are always telling you and being critical of how you're doing things, um, that didn't ever feel very good. And I used to always say, well, you know, you got a chance to participate in this process and run or or do it in whatever way. And uh, so, without that agency, now it would be almost a little hypocritical of me to continue to. If I if I was really that interested, I would just run it. And so I really have stepped away, and um, and it's funny. And and you know George Cuff and Ian, you when you do your seminars, he's always said, well, you know, one minute you're elected, next minute you're not. And I heard that many times, and and believe me, that's that's the reality. You you are just there, and um, people aren't knocking your door or phoning you up to see how you're doing or ask you for advice, etc. You are you are now not elected. All right. Well, it's a nice little segue then to my final question. We talked about kind of where. 
the, the before, the, the now, and now we're looking for what's next. What is next for, for you after your year of rumination? Yeah, it's still uh, it's still undefined. Uh, and I think when I think about, you know, the notion of retiring withdrawing, I think for me, there's there's a few broad categories on the horizon. I'll continue and still do volunteer in things now. Not many, but I, I want to put a plug in for the local repair cafe. Uh, Ian and I, you've talked about it. That that combines my my other skill with fixing things with community connection. Uh, that's the sort of thing on a volunteer basis. So I will. I will be very selective in terms of uh, the number of things that I get involved with. I, I do believe that I, I'm interested in and also need to, to a certain extent, look to some employee that generates some income. So there's a lot of years ahead and uh, I would prefer to, you know, be able to make it till the end, whenever that, uh, that is. Um, I may do some consulting type work, uh, related to what you just talked about or even other things. And, um, and the, you know, a, a big part of what I've been doing is um, time, call it whatever you like, self-care time, personal work time. I have really, um, the, the, door, the door has really opened up to a, a different way of living that is, um, is a little more focused on on let's say who I am at the core, uh, without the strappings or the trappings of the external world, and who I am at the core, and how can Jeff, in that mode, best uh, best be with others, family, community, etc., uh, going forward. And that has I've been you know like I say putting a lot of work into that, and that will continue, and and that's uh, exciting and scary and and uh rewarding and emotional and all of the above all at once so um so that's yeah that's what the future holds and it's of course like many people stay tuned eight years in public office one year post public office in private life is the jeff we're talking to today the same jeff that entered public office in 2014 and if not how has jeff changed to better serve his community in those more public roles that he potentially might be entering into, whether it be through volunteerism or mm. through other uh, avenues. Yeah. Yeah. No, great question. Um, I'll say just, just straightforward. The, the Jeff today is not the same Jeff that was uh, entered politics in 2014. And I think there was an awful lot of factors there. When I think back to, 14, um, having been involved in the community associations, as you read out earlier, a lot of issues, you know, tough issues on the periphery, not being involved. I will say in 2011, I uh, made the decision to uh, quit uh, quit drinking. And so I, I say that because that also has allowed me to evolve as a different person from that point forward. So there was there was there was a lot of stress, a lot going on in fourteen. Just age of my children, a lot more going on in life, and and so entering into that, I I knew what I knew at that time. The last eight years has provided me with the uh, the opportunity, and I've been a privilege to learn an awful lot more about how local government works, how we do govern ourselves. Uh, how I can or how anyone can participate in that process through the period, understanding, as I said earlier in the interview today, uh, what roles we play and why it's important. You come in a little bit charged with, okay, I'm here. I, I know how to do ABC. I'm going to get in there and really show everyone that I can do that. And you realize, well, the system's not set up to, to, to handle that input. So the role playing and, and what roles are required the the examples of going through different difficult situations and dialogue have helped me as i've talked about be a better person in terms of handling that so when i think about going forward i think that i'm i'm a i'm a more well-rounded person in terms of my knowledge of the community first of all i know an awful lot of people now that i didn't know before which is great for community and great for connection and I'll continue to do that, as I said, because that's really important to me. 
I know a lot more about myself and what my role is, as I said, in the evolution of both my life and the community uh, around me. And I, I want to, as best I can, hang on to the optimism and the, and the, and the, the kindness and the sense of sort of connection and love that exists in all of us and is absolutely, in my opinion, required for us to create societies and, and our environment the way that we want them uh, to be. And um, that's not, not an easy task, but it seems like a good place to start from. Jeff, um, I want to thank you. I want to thank you from both Ian and myself for sitting down, taking time out of your busy schedule. But I want to pick up on something just a little bit here. And I just want to say thank you for opening up there. Um, as someone who's battled uh, addictions and uh, is on the sobriety path, it is, it is reassuring to hear that people who have been in public roles like you have are have deal with the same issues that everyday people deal with. So thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you for being part of the political trenches, local government at work. It's always great to have people on like yourself who are willing to chat about time in political office. Thanks, Jeff. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, I'll go back to 2011. That That is one of the best decisions I've ever made in my entire life. Our full we'll interview with Jeff will be airing next Wednesday and we'll be right back after this quick break. So Ian, ours for retirement, a great interview with Jeff there. How do you think the episode go went? I'm not completely surprised by how it went. Uh, I have actually known Jeff for some time. I was really pleased when he agreed to agree uh, appear on the podcast talking about retired. I actually interviewed uh, Jeff as one of the mayors in the DNA of great leaders. So I had known about his experience even when he was mayor too. So I was, he's always been a very thoughtful, introspective fellow. And I think that really came across in our conversation today. Now, for those who want to pick up Ian's book, The DNA of Great Leaders, the link will be in the show notes as well. So be sure to grab a copy of that. You will not be upset that you grabbed a copy. It's a great retrospect. Uh, I, I want to sort of uh, let's pick your brain here for a second, because there's some big things coming up for strategic steps. And there's some big you're going to be traveling here uh, through Atlantic Canada. I say Atlantic Canada because we don't want to differentiate between <laughs> the Maritimes and Atlantic Canada from our previous episodes. But are you looking? forward to getting out to Atlantic Canada and seeing and meeting with some of the local leaders and administrations out there? I'm I'm itching to get at that. So uh, we have uh, be attending a conference of uh, municipal administrators in Nova Scotia uh, the week of the 16th. Uh, the following week, uh, I'll be at the, uh, so the Newfoundland the municipality, Municipalities Newfoundland, Newfoundland and Labrador. Labrador. Thank you. Their conference. Um, as a, a participant there as well. So in between, we'll be visiting some of our Atlantic clients and popping in on some people who I haven't met. So yeah, I'm really excited to get going to do this. Be sure to, for those who are tuning in who are in Atlantic Canada and especially particularly in the Newfoundland Labrador, be sure to head over to the Strategic Steps uh, booth while you're there because Craig Pollitt, past guest, but also Vice President of Atlantic uh, Strategic Steps is there and Ian will be there as well. So you do not want to miss that. But Ian, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to chat with you and learn a little bit more about the political trenches and how they work. More fun in local government land, Chris. Yeah, it's been fun. Thanks. See you in two weeks, everyone.